Art is the author of Outcome Management, Gossip, You Won't Believe This, Creating a Positive Organizational Culture, and numerous other publications. He considers himself to be a possible charian. So please welcome my friend Art to talk about a new plan, renewing the promise of person-centered planning. Contrary to anything you heard about possibilitarians, we do not eat our young. That's just an evil rumor. I was thinking about uh, the presentation after I had a chance to communicate uh, with Mary Kay, and I couldn't help but think back several years ago. And I was in my office, and I got a call from a young lady, and uh, she was very cordial, and invited me to come out to a western state and talk to the providers and actually the state officials and it turns out that they were not getting along and I was rather busy and I sort of I tried to decline the uh, the opportunity but she was rather insistent and said would you please come and talk with us especially around things like organizational culture and communication so I, I said yes a couple of weeks go by and I get an email from her and said dear Mr. Dykstra we're putting our program to get together. Could you please tell us the three objectives you have for uh, giving your talk here in this state? I thought that was curious, so I just threw it away. A couple of weeks later, I got another email saying, Dear Mr. Dykes, we're putting our program together only a month ago. Could you please tell us the three objectives you have in coming and talking with us? So uh, I thought, well, they're the ones who asked me. So anyway, she called me up and it's now only a month ago, and she says to me, Mr. Dykstra, I said, what? She said, we really have to have your three objectives. So I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, you guys are the ones who invited me. What were your objectives? And it was just silence. She said, would you really do me a favor, and would you send me your three objectives? And remember, this was several years ago. So I said, okay. So the next day, I emailed her my speech objectives, and they were this. My objective is to comfort the afflicted, to afflict the comfortable, and get out of town without being hurt. <laughs> I've stuck with them, so today, I want, you know, I'm going to try to afflict the comfortable, comfort the afflicted, and get out of town without being hurt. A few words just about Trinity, because some of you may not know the orientation of that. Uh, actually, in 2020, we'll be celebrating our 70th uh, year. Uh, like a lot of organizations, we were founded by parents who came together unhappy uh, with the circumstances for their, their children. So I mentioned we're located in one of the southwest suburbs, a statewide organization that uh, provides a wide range of services, all the ones that you're involved in, I'm sure, residential services, day services. We serve about 600 people residentially in all kinds of different environments, have about 1,100 employees. We've known a lot across the country for the work we do with the duly diagnosed. Those people have both a mental illness and a developmental disability. Uh, and so the other thing that came out of that that you might be interested in is that we also, in a partnership with the Hope Institute in Springfield, operate what's called the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. That as we have teams throughout the state of Illinois that if a person is in danger at high risk, whether medically or behaviorally, we would dispatch a team to try to help that person uh, not lose their home or to be having to go into any other kind of, uh, of adjustment. The other thing that I think we're proud of is our emphasis on having a positive culture. And I would just ask you, I'm just curious, how many people here in your organization have a mascot? Two. I'll just tell you, I think you miss the boat if you don't entertain the idea of having a mascot. There's unbelievable opportunities for appreciation and recognition. We happen to have a mascot called Lily Leapit. It's a frog about, well, can be as tall as people get into the costume, I guess. But it's amazing what that, that the impact that has on our organization from a positive perspective. And then lastly, the thing that we've been working on hard, and I left Trinity last, uh, I think it was last January, my son Thane, who couldn't be with us today, uh, he's actually speaking at another conference. He was our CFO and he became the CEO, and then I moved over to the foundation into Cherry Hill. But one of the things that we tried to emphasize and we could talk along about, a lot about that today, and is how do we want to be together? That to me is key in anything we do, 
is how do we want to be together. So today what I want to do is really share some experiences with you in terms of how we got better, I believe, uh, at, at Trinity and how we want to continue to get better in the future. So I want to share some of our experiences, uh, especially around the development and looking at person-centered planning. So that's what I'm going to kind of focus on today when we talk about a new plan, renewing the promise of person-centered planning. A fellow by the name of Anthony Hinks shared an interesting thought that we would just share with you at this moment. And that is, to understand the reasons, you must first look at the origins. So the origins of our efforts in trying to help us do a better job at Trinity probably go back to around 2010, 2012, something like that. And what the leadership group that I was a part of, what we recognized is that every place we went, people seemed to be down. And we know why, we heard about that this morning, huge staff shortages, not enough money. We went through a period of time in Illinois, there was 10 years went by without any kind of a rate increase. And every place you went, you heard things are bad. The system is broken. And indeed, Illinois had many problems then, and has just as many today. And I would tell you this, from my perspective, person-centered planning in Illinois is very much broken, and it's very upsetting to me. We don't even use teams anymore in terms of how we go about trying to support people. So we realized that even as we looked at our person-centered planning, and we shared our plans, but we came to realize that a lot of the people that we supported didn't like their plans. And we were one of those providers who gave them a copy anyway. But that began to bother us, as why didn't people really like those plans? I want to put this into a context that you're probably aware of. Person-centered planning isn't something you accomplish. Say, ha, ah, thank God we're done. There are very few permanent victories in human services. I hope you understand that. I'll share a little example. Some of you have had this experience. We have a woman who's been with us for eight years. And she runs and operates and leads a small day program, let's say 30 people. And she's wonderful. If you go to that program, people are using person-centered speech. People are not talking about people that we serve in front of them. There's a great spirit in the air. There's a little staff turnover. And guess what happens? Unbeknownst to us, she was not planning on leaving. We weren't planning on having her leave. But her husband gets transferred to another state and she leaves. So what happens, and this is a reality we didn't talk about this morning so much when we talked about direct support staff. Because everything that goes on when you're losing that many direct support staff, you're also losing the people above them. Because they're also working overtime and they're also getting burned out. We didn't get that many applicants when we tried to fill that job. So we hired the person we thought was the best. And she was, she was a very good person. But what do you think happened in about two months? We recognized that the program had taken a step backwards. You probably know that the path of destruction is much faster than a path of construction. And so there we are. People are not even using person-centered language anymore. Now we have to go back to the basics again. A program that we were proud of, we are now worried about. And that's why I say I don't believe there are any permanent victories in human services. And the truth is we're either moving ahead or moving backwards. We don't stay the same. I believe that people leak and people stray. There is a reality of entropy in organizations. Things I think do decline into disorder. And one of the things that we don't talk about enough, and I'm going to mention it a couple times later, when you're trying to do your best and trying to get better, leadership takes a heck of a lot of energy. We began to talk to people in other organizations. We began to read. And I have this thought that I will share with you, and it goes like this. To lead well, you must read well. I absolutely believe that. To lead well, you must read well. I just saw a statistic yesterday, it was about five years old. I was amazed by it. And it was put together by the Literary Volunteers of America. And what they said is, in the United States, 44% of the people, 40% of the adults in the United States don't read one book in a period of a year. So one of the things that happened around 2010, 2012, we discovered the contributions of positive psychology. We shared books with, with one another. The first book we came across was called The Positive Dog. Has anybody read The Positive Dog? Excellent. We read How Full Is Your Bucket? 
by Don Clifton, super better with Jane McGonnell. By the way, if you're interested in things like gamification, especially as it pertains to using social technology, I strongly encourage to read that book. She was a, she's a, a gamester and uh, wrote the book after she had a very serious concussion. If you have anybody, any friend who's wrestling with recovery, I'd encourage you to read that book. Another book you'll hear us mention at the end of this presentation is How to Have a Good Day, written by Catherine Webb, another excellent book. And then we picked up Flourish, written by Martin Sugleman, who people have characterized as the father of positive psychology. How many have ever read Flourish? Okay, so now I need to ask. I know you guys are from all over the country. You all have bookstores? <laughs> Heard of Amazon? Just a sidebar, I wasn't planning on saying this. I was talking to Mary Kay. Interesting things happen when you share the books that you read. And as it turned out, we were in the council. Tina and I were there at the same time. It was that particular time when I was in the council that we came across the book called Bowling Alone. Do you remember that? And Jim Gardner read it, the CEO at that time. And I basically give credit to CEO and Jim for introducing a social capital across the country. That book had that much of an impact on us from what we read and what we shared. So I know that reading makes a difference in our lives and, and how we accomplish the things we want to accomplish. And then I think we mentioned the, the book Grit. But that then led to another book, and that became the beginning of us kind of thinking about, Thane and I especially, working with our leadership group to maybe try to put this together as a, as a book that we could share with others, and you'll understand why in a second. So we read a book called Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. Now, I'm just going to take a step back. When I read The Positive Dog, that was the first book I read in around 2012, that was very instructive and, and he had research on his side. And what he said is, if you wanna feel better, if you wanna have a positive attitude, don't watch the news in the morning. I actually have quit watching the news in the morning. Sean Anker wrote a book called Big Potential. He demonstrates the research. If you watch the news in the morning, newscasters across can import bad news from even other states and other countries because of what they show you that happened in your town isn't bad enough. And people will talk about how long during the course of the day you'll be down as a result of taking all that stuff in. So we read Factfulness. And that, for me, when I read it, and Thane and I talked about it a lot, it was a light bulb moment for me, quite frankly. And this is what he revealed. Hans Rosling was a Swedish physician and epidemiologist. He actually finished writing the book, Dying in a Hospital, and his son and daughter-in-law finished the book. But here's an interesting thing he shared that just stuck with my, my, my brain. He said this, things can be both bad and better at the same time. Things can be both bad and better at the same time. Now remember, we got sucked into complaining and whining and saying everything's bad, the system is broken, woe is us. And he gives the example of a baby born prematurely. And the youngster might only weigh a pound or two and a half pounds. And once we agree, that's bad. But what happens in a few weeks? The baby gains four or six ounces. And the baby is still bad. But now the baby is better. We have to change our thinking. Things can be both bad and better at the same time. So those of us who are working together in the leadership at Trinity at that time kind of made a commitment to learn how to live with the bad, but to focus on getting better. It was a matter of discussion, it was a matter of conversation, and we said, we need to rethink this. And this, by the way, didn't happen just one day sitting around a table. I believe there's no such thing as all of a sudden. I'd like to write a book by that name. The good things that happen in your life, probably not all of a sudden. The bad things, people say, they happened all of a sudden. Probably not. This was a journey we were on. We got to that point where we said, we can do something and improve ourselves personally and professionally and organizationally. It was that time we introduced a word to our vocabulary and we said to ourselves, we can become possibilitists. We believe in possibilities, that one can always do the next best thing. I should charge you extra for that thought. <laughs> we can always do the next best thing. Progress is possible. And the goal, by the way, is progress, not perfection. 
So many organizations fall down when they're not going to get anything done. We've got to do it perfect right from the beginning. It doesn't happen that way. So as I said, as we sat around and we talked, many of those conversations were individually. Some were in small groups. But we decided we had to do something different. We had to get out of the whining and the complaining. And as I said, in the leadership of Trinity at that time, there's probably 10 or 15 of us, went back to the basics and we said, we have to ask the question. We have to ask the important question. We have to quit saying, as soon as. How many times have you said that in your career? As soon as we have enough staff, then we'll be able to do that. As soon as we have the money, we'll be able to do that. We said, we just got to put that aside. We're never going to have enough. This is something I would share with you instructively, and this would be the thought. Don't let the best you have done so far be the standard for the rest of your life. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So the question is, we ask ourselves the question that I would ask you to ask yourselves and your organizations, and that is, why do we do what we do? And it's not about improving scores on state surveys. And by the way, it's not even about increasing the number of outcomes in your organization. I talked to some people yesterday, and they were very proud. In their organization, they had moved up from having 14 outcomes per an average or agency to 17. That's laudable, but that's not why we're here. It's not about getting people jobs either. I think the big why is to help people live their best life possible to flourish and not languish. When we were having this conversation, we thought about a plant. For most of you, there's exceptions here. Most of you know the difference between a live plant and a dead plant. Some people, by the way, I've watched them keep on watering dead plants. But there's a difference between flourishing and languishing. If you have a vegetable garden, you know when your garden is flourishing, right? It's bearing fruit. And so what we said is that we have to concentrate on helping people flourish. So this led to organizational changes and development of what we then began to refer to as my plan to flourish. My plan to flourish is based on three knowledge platforms. The principles of person-centered planning, CQL personal outcome measures, and the essential elements of well-being. Let's just take a second and just look at those principles of person-centered planning. As I mentioned, one of the things that we did is we've talked to people across the country. We read more than we probably even wanted to. Nowhere could I find the 10 principles of person-centered planning. And quite frankly, it makes no difference to me if there's 11 or there's 12. Next time you see me, maybe I'll say there's 14. But I couldn't find a codified version that said to me, this is what it looks like the 10 principles are. There's probably nothing new here, except there's a couple things I want to highlight. Obviously, choice, we've talked about that today. Huge, being in community. But go down, you're, you're familiar with all of those, but go down to planning starts with deep, genuine listening. We also think that written plans that are valued help achievement, and lastly, Plans are only as good as they're implemented. So well-being, as I mentioned, really came out of the thoughts of Martin Segelman in his book, Flourish. I'd encourage you to read that. Well-being is a theory of uncoerced choice. It's focusing on the positive side of life, how we flourish. And in fact, positive psychology studies what makes life worth living. One of the things I would encourage you to do is actually think if this makes some sense to you and you're going to look about cleanness in your organization, think about having classes, not only for your staff on, the, on essential ingredients of well-being, but also for the people you serve and support. It makes sense to teach people what's going to affect them. Why is this important to us? It's important to us. Because all of this is based on science. All of this is based on positive psychology, which you know is, is a branch of psychology. So let's talk a little bit about the elements of well-being. When we talk about the elements of well-being, we first of all talk about positive emotions. What words come to mind when we think about positive emotions? Satisfaction, hope, cheerfulness, enjoyment, savoring the good, happiness, contentment. 
Positive emotions help us enjoy life more fully. So when we are enjoying ourselves right now, how many of you ever heard of forest bathing? Anybody? A couple people? I was fascinated by that. One of the things we know improves positive emotions is in the United States today is called forest therapy. It started in Japan in the late 1980s, and it was basically called Shinrin Yoku. And what happened is, is people just realized the, the psychological and the benefits of being in the outdoors. Now, if you're interested in forest bathing, I'll tell you two important things. Leave your phone behind and know how to recognize poison ivy. <laughs> it would be helpful to you. But if you're a provider in a, in a competitive market, give thought to certifying your staff as forest therapists. Maybe you'll bring some more people in. We tend to follow those kinds of fashions. But today in the United States, forest therapy is a big business. You can become certified as a forest therapist. If I ever retire, maybe I'll be a forest therapist. One of the things we do at Trinity when we talk about positive emotions, we celebrate a day called Kindness Day. I don't have the time to elaborate, but really what happens on that day, staff share notes with one another and they sign their name to them. And they point out to a person what that person has meant to them over the course of that year. And it really is a day of celebration. And I could tell you all kinds of funny things that, that we've done that, uh, as a result of that. But sometimes we forget about the little things that increase our positive emotions. The research just tells us as you can look it up. How many realize that singing makes us happier? It absolutely does. I have six grandkids, and Jillian is my youngest. And one of the things I did with every one of my grandkids when they were maybe three or four years old, I would sing with them. And I, I'll tell you an interesting thing that went on. Sometimes I would make up the words, and we'd have a lot of fun. But one of the favorite songs, one of my favorite songs is, I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener. That's what I'd really like to be, because if I was an Oscar Mayer wiener, everybody would be in love with me. And my daughter, Megan, called my wife, Anita, one day, and Anita says, how's that going? She says, it's going great. But she says, Jillian is driving us nuts. She's just walking around the house saying, I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener. That's what I'd really like to be. See, if Mary Kay would have given me more time, I'd have us sing it right now. I really would, and I would bet you a, a hot dog bun you would feel better. I really do. So if you go to, I shouldn't tell you this. If you go to a boring session tomorrow, <laughs> just say, I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener. I love that song. Singing elevates our emotions, right? It makes us feel better. Why wouldn't we want that to be available to the people we serve and support? Positive emotions. Engagement is the second essential element being so immersed in an activity that it seems like time has vanished. It happens when we're involved in our hobbies, in our friendship networks, at our job in music. It's when we're completely absorbed. And believe me, I know some of the people we serve and support. I know when they're engaged. And then I think as a very key element is the matter of positive relationships. The fact is, other people matter. Positive relations occur when we come together with another person, when we connect. One of the things that we know, and you know, is who we work with is vital to how we feel about ourselves. Many times, the work, who we work with is more important to us than what we're actually doing. Some of you saw the studies where people were demonstrating that some bosses really do kill their employees. They really do elevate their blood pressures so they have heart attacks. One of the things that saddens me when I've had a chance to look at personal center plans in other organizations in other states is so often people neglect what's important. And I'll talk about it again in a second, but what people will do oftentimes is they will substitute extrinsic goals and motives for intrinsic ones. What do I mean by that? So what do I see? And I see this increasing in Illinois. I see the plans coming in, quote, quotes the discovery place, around things and objects. It's like there's a, there are people are asking for Christmas presents. 
And it could have only one or two outcomes thereafter. And it could be, Art would like to save money for a new clock. Art would like to have a new television. That's, that's not what we mean when we're talking about positive relationships. If you knew that person and talked to that person, what do you think you'd know with some people? I know this from a fact, from talking to people. They would like a best friend. They'd like somebody they could hang out with. But here we are concerned about objects. And then there's the issue of meaning. Belonging to and sensing something that you believe is bigger than yourself. And again, Seglemann unfolded that. What do we know from science? We know that people who realize meaning in their lives are healthier and live longer. So the question is, I suppose, I don't have any right to ask you, but the question is, do you have purpose in your life? Have you found meaning in what you're doing, what you're experiencing? And if you have, why wouldn't we think that the people we serve and support might be interested in having meaning in their lives as well? I sometimes have a thought that might be different from others, and that is this, that I believe that meaning for the most part is realized and discovered more than it's searched for. Now, I love Viktor Frankl's book, In Search of Meaning, and so, so did you. But there's a time in our life when we some, somehow we discover what the meaning was in going on in our lives, and it, changes, and it changes our lives. And again, so often, we have overlooked that with the people we serve and support. Why? One individual who I think is an outstanding psychologist, a woman by the name of Ellen Langer, said, we're guilty of making premature cognitive commitments. I love that notion. And what happens when we make a premature cognitive commitment is we rule something out. We don't rule, we don't rule meaning in. We think that's probably how oh, they're impaired. That's probably not a part of their life. And we sell people short. I believe that a lot of people we serve and support absolutely find meaning in genuine volunteerism. And I mean that, genuine, I'm not talking about six people riding in a van taking a meal in a styrofoam container to some old lady. I don't call that meaningful volunteerism. I'm talking when people know that they've made a difference in somebody else's life. I know our folks, because I've talked to them about it experience meaning in their lives. Then we have the issue of accomplishment, attaining our goals, hitting the target, crossing the finish line. Crossing the finish line brings a sense of fulfillment. Crossing off things on your to-do list. I'm sure you get a kick out of that just like I do. It's when we better ourselves. I remember a couple of times I've actually added some things so I could cross them off at half done. I needed a boost. So somebody else has done it too. And I'm not talking, I just saw this recently, I'm not talking about the person who can now distinguish between a nickel and a quarter seven out of 10 times in three consecutive trials. That's not what I call accomplishment. I get, by the way, that we're talking and we're gonna talk in a little bit about what we're doing that we're talking with some people who have some significant impairments and have some challenges. And I worry that, that that can be difficult. But accomplishment is huge. One of the things that drives me nuts when we, when we talk about accomplishment is the things we settle for. I was actually amazed, and Connie Melvin, who's with us, was doing some help for me. The number of applications and the helps that are out there now to help people learn how to read are mind-boggling. Think how much of the difference it made in your life when you could read. We have people in our midst that are trying to get a clock when they could learn how to read. How dumb is that? So we need to worry about accomplishment. And then, with respect to those dimensions, several other research had added the last element, and that is the element of well-being called health. And by the way, this is very significant. And it's not just talking about the absence of disease. When we talk about health, we're talking about what your energy level is. I remember I talked about leadership takes a lot of energy. It does. So does optimism. Pessimism takes away energy from us. 
So it's important how we eat and how we move and how we sleep. It's important how we restore our energy. I take the position, and I know it's very popular. I just heard a politician on, on television. I take the position that life is a series of sprints. It's not a marathon. You don't just set a pace. If you're a manager or a leader in an organization, human service says, it's not a long marathon. You just got it out. And you, the problem is you never know when the race starts. But all of a sudden you find yourself running. And what I've shared with people, what's so important when you're in those races is to make sure you rest in between the races. You need to restore your energy. So when we talk about improving our well-being, we can look at it from the standpoint of what should we do inside ourselves. And I know when we talk about improving our well-being, it sounds easier than it is. It's not like laying down on a beach or something. It's not like getting a suntan. But if we're worried about our own personal well-being, then I think that we should look at, we should kind of inventory our own well-being. And if there's areas we'd like to improve in, then we should develop some goals. And we should create some well-being habits. It is true in my mind that, that life is a journey and these things take time. We never are totally well-being. We're never totally pes I mean, optimistic or pessimistic for that matter. There's a reference that I would share and again, if you're interested in, in this, want to get more involved with your organization, there's a, a book written by Michelle McQuaid and Peggy Kern called Your Well-Being Blueprint. Absolutely excellent book. It's kind of a toolkit. It would help you, it help me, it help your friends, it would help the people that you serve. And as I said, if you're going to look at classes, you might look at that. Now, one of the things that, that we did uh, when we were involved in putting this together we absolutely rejected the idea, and, oh, and some of you might give thought to your organization. We rejected the idea of building a person-centered plan around the elements of PERMA. And I got nervous when people would say, what we should do is have a, a P goal, an E goal, an R goal, an M goal. To me, that was goofy. You want to keep those things in mind. That's why we talked about bringing the three platforms of knowledge together so we could help people live a better life. So that then led us to what we're going to talk about next, which is my plan to flourish. My plan to flourish consists of two components, a personal profile and a set of goal cards. And I would tell you this, this format, what I'm going to share with you in a second, was very well received by the people we support and their families, especially moms and dads. They really did love it. And by the way, and she can tell me if I'm wrong, with the time we were putting this together, Trina Sealing, who you met this morning, was part of our, our leadership group, and I believe it was Trina's idea to put it together as a trifold. I think she came, was that right? I was fascinated when she came to my office and she said, what do you think about this? Such good things happen when we talk about relationships with other people. What I want to share with you, what we refer to as the eight conversation channels. And so, what you see is really a trifold made out of about an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. We decided to lead it off with a, with a picture. And don't take this for granted, by the way. Take the right picture, not a mugshot. And I don't know, I can't help you with applications, but nobody wants a picture of themselves squashed or the head looks like it's the wrong. So take the time if you're going to do this to present the person well. And so we, we began with the statement, I am great, grateful. And you're not going to be able to read all that, but the important thing is what we thought about is how a person wants to introduce himself or herself to another person. I am grateful. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtue, as Cicero said, but the parent of all others. And so we literally sit with our folks. That's why I said the benefit of classes, so people have an appreciation in what Gratitude is, is why so many people have gratitude journals. And you, you strengthen your relationship with others when you share with people what you're grateful for, right? And then the second one is what people like and admire, and admire about me. And here again, what we've gone through is some of the things of talking to the person, trying to always build off their strengths. So we present ourselves to another person in our person-centered plan, we're talking about our strengths the third category 
keys to coaching me. This, I think, is huge, by the way. We're not talking about coaching like Mike Gitka yelling at Chicago Bears. <laughs> We're talking about a collegial relationship. I actually believe that coaches bring out the best in others. That's what it's all about. If you went to our organization and you asked our direct support staff if they could show them your business card, they would. And on their business card, it would say, independent living coach. All of our staff have a business card. We view all of our staff as being professional. That's why they too would have a business card. And that's what it says, independent living coach. There's a book called Practicing Positive Psychology Coaching by Robert Diener. Mary Keane might have met uh, his dad. Uh, his, dad, he did, his dad was at the University of Illinois in Champaign, did a lot of the early work on, on, uh, on happiness. But as I said, I think coaching brings out the, the best in others. Joe this morning alluded to the need for a new profession. And several of us in this room, in particular a colleague of mine, Tina Campanella, have, have been talking about the, the, the breakthrough that we might see is the is the evolution of the, I actually could be a job or position, of a, of a coach. I don't know how many of you are familiar with CHAD. It's an organization that supports people with attention deficit disorder. You might check out their website. You might check out one of their conferences. They have done an unbelievable job of using coaches with people with attention deficit disorder, some with significant challenge of attention deficit disorder. What I'm fascinated by, and I know we have people at Trinity when I was there, we have people with a disability who I believe could become very capable coaches. Absolutely. So when we talk about manpower problems and these problems, those problems, we've got to be creative. But I'm absolutely convinced. I met these coaches. I was fascinated in what they know about, all the way from mindfulness to anger management to helping people based on how uh, their, their difficulty is. They can be available to them to a greater or lesser extent. We know this, across the country, we, we overserve a lot of people. I'm probably guilty of that, or was guilty of that. But I believe that coaching represents an opportunity to look at what we do differently into the future. And then we talk about what makes me uncomfortable. We thought that was important. And again, we had talked to a lot of different people, read a lot of different things. Some people in this room would probably be important to people. I had a board member who freaked out when she came to my office. I had a brass snake that was curled about that long. And she came in, I thought she was having a heart attack. And then she shared with me how much she was afraid of snakes. So we got rid of the snake. But what makes me uncomfortable, there are some people we know, loud noises makes them uncomfortable. There's other people that when people fight in front of them, it makes them uncomfortable. We thought that would be important to share. And the purpose of my plan to flourish is to work, is to, is to share it with the people who are helping you. The next section is I am proud of. This to me also was important. Again, trying to work off of people's strengths. There's a woman by the name of Lady Mary Monacu. I, I, I love the observation she made. Some of you might remember her if I put it in context. You know, in the late 1600s, she became famous really around the world for introducing the, the, the notion of inoculating people for smallpox. But this is what she said, you can be pleased with nothing when you're not pleased with yourself. And I think that's true of the people we serve and support. We want them, if they don't already, to like themselves and to present themselves. And then we turn to the issue of health and wellness. And this happens to be one of those areas in particular where we take the position that everybody doesn't need to know everything. You don't need to list every operation you had or this or that. But if a person has a particularly larger concern, what you'll find in one of these plant, my plans of flourish is a reference, please see my chart or please see a record, whatever you call it in your organization, for further information. Because we don't want to put people in jeopardy. If it's something that's really you know, a, a major concern, we will. Then those elements end with my priorities and my interests. This has huge implications, not only for the people we serve and support, but also for our direct support staff. So from that, then, we go to our goal cards. So what I want to do is just talk about goal setting. We've, we've, we've wrestled with this all kinds of different ways. This is what we know from neuroscience, right? We know that the person is more likely to remember their goals and act on their goals if they write them down themselves. We absolutely know that. 
<laughs> doctors make an appointment, if they really want you to keep their appointment, they should give you the card and have you write down it. And they should tell you the, the time and the date. It will register in your head, it will encode it. And for those people who can't write, there's nothing wrong with cutting a picture out of a book that means that, that illustrates what they're after. Or drawing a picture. It doesn't have to be sentences, but if the person can do it, it's their plan. And so we would ask them to complete those cards. And then it's always wiser, and again, the research tells us this, to express goals positively. I would like to. It was an interesting study done, I forget which university, where college freshmen, of course, uh, who wrote down the goal of I do not want to be tardy, their, their, their time management actually got worse. Better to express your goals in a positive fashion. And it's also important to modify the goals. Uh, you know, goals are basically the stuff you want to get done in your life. We change our minds. The people we serve support should be allowed to change their minds for sure. The other things that we look at when we're helping people set goals is to look at is like, is their options. How much help will they need? And we try to have that conversation with them. How much help will you need to pull this off? And then what are the action steps? And with people who have, let's say, greater challenges, they might have to have more action steps, right? So that for we have to be on top of that. We want to we wanna do that. So then what we decided to do is look at the goal cards from the standpoint of a time frame. And it's very important, by the way, taking a step back, to make sure that goals are tracked and monitored. And even more importantly, it's important that they're celebrated. So we have then near-term goals. I'm probably more passionate about near-term goals than any other time frame. So much happens in our life in the year that we don't pay attention to. And we talked about the consequences of, of staff shortages. But you know how many people we, we serve who'd like to be with their buddies every Friday night or every other Friday night playing video games? Sometimes I think it helps to write that down. And I, I don't worry too much about service objectives and all that kind of stuff. I'm worried about what would make that person's life better. What would, what would help them feel better about themselves and others? So we have the near term, which usually is up to about a year. And these are the ones that turn over the most. And they should. If we're making progress, the, 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 the priority here always, of course, is when somebody uh, com completes a goal, they sustain it and keep it. So we have to worry about that as well. The second time period we refer to as midterm. I think this is the trickiest one. This is kind of like the two to four year kind of one. It doesn't make any difference to me if it's 18 months or four years and three months. I don't get that rigid. But this is tricky because oftentimes we have to do readjusting. Because oftentimes these goals are, are dependent on subsequent learning. And a person may not have been learning something as fast as we hoped they would. So we have to go back to the drawing board. And like I said, in some instances, we thought the person was going to move much quicker than they did. So we had to uh, relook at the, the, the time. Then the last aspect is long-term, which typically refer to as hopes and dreams. Well, I was in an earlier session, which I really enjoyed, talking about people who maybe have had less life experience or, or lesser abilities. I still think it's important to think about them and talk to the people who know them best, whether it's mom and dad or the staff, that they too have a dream. And if we think about it, it's okay with me that we infer it. It's okay to be wrong. We're not there to harm them. But if we do that, I think the staff and us help that person view the future more positively. That's, that's the point. And then we have the fourth goal area. And this will be obvious to anybody in this room who is married. And this is goals recommended by others. <laughs> My wife has a lot of goals for me. And we decided, wouldn't it just be more honest to talk about goals recommended by others? Instead of saying, Art would like to go to the doctor, Art, I don't like going to the dentist. I, why would you write down, I want to go to a damn dentist? I don't like dentists. <laughs> so we have a section, and, and as was said this morning, to the extent possible, the people we work, in, work with can turn down those recommendations. They say, I don't necessarily want to do that. And I think we are growing in an era where people are, are, are growing in their ability to say no. The goal cards then are gathered up, and we don't care how many you have. 
and they're put in an envelope. And the envelope uh, is kept with a person. Uh, and one of the things that we try to write these goals at are, is using the language I would like to. I go crazy when I see plans that say he will. I absolutely get goosebumps. It's like, you're kidding me, right? And I consider a lot of those providers to be obedience factories. He will. When the goals are done, we, we would suggest that you use engagement helps. Things like checklists, notebooks, posters, sticky notes. It's important that the person have a copy of the plan. And realize this, some goals are failed and others are quit and people have a right to change their mind. Your person-centered plan, as you rethink the future, doesn't have to look like that. But it should be looked at like that. You say it again. Your person-centered plan doesn't have to look like that, but it should be looked at like that. How do we accomplish it? We highly endorse a team approach. We still think that a lot of the work that John O'Brien did and Connie did in terms of bringing support groups together is very significant. It's too bad it's eroded out of Illinois. If I had more time, I would talk to you about the role of a champion. We've kind of traded the word facilitator for champion. I think what helps our people accomplish their goals more than anything is having a champion. Someone in their life is going to bat for them. Someone who's advocating for them. Someone who, as Sean Anker says, is a praise provider in their life. Here's a, an observation. I found this peculiar because I don't know what Dr. Seuss was thinking about this. So if you're a case manager or you're a Q or you're a social worker, you're helping people do plans, think about this. Feel this. Don't just read this. He says, to the world you may be only be one person, but to one person you may be the world. This is sort of a highlight that we share with staff that gives you an overview to be on track, making sure that you are doing person center playing the way it's intended. But let me, in terms of the time that's remaining, let me move to some conversation about obstacles. I was at a conference with Michael Small a couple of years ago, and we were talking about person-centered planning. And one of the things that Michael said to me, he said, you know what the problem is, don't you, Art? And I said, no. He said, the problem is person-centered plans aren't implemented. And that's so true in so many places. So to me, the essential question here is not that we aren't going to have, have obstacles. The question is how we think about them and what we do about them. Let me just uh, share some, briefly some of the internal obstacles. One internal obstacle is having a compliance mindset. It's something I have to do. It's just more paperwork. It's another long firm. And what you see is there's no passion. There's no commitment. There's no champion. Some of you probably haven't heard the term inscape before. It's a term that comes out of philosophy. I love that notion. You're familiar with landscapes. But think about inscapes. See, from, a, from, a, from an internal standpoint, you're the curator of the fixtures of your mind. You are the content specialist of what goes on inside of you. So review. So don't get caught into a compliance mindset. I was curious yesterday, just across the street at the Hilton, the National Association of Compliance Officers were meeting. <laughs> I wanted to crash it. That would be my absolutely worst job. I would flunk at it. I would be, I'm sure I would be booted out of the organization. But here's a thought to share with your staff. I used to tell this to our staff all the time when they'd be complaining about paperwork. Here's the deal. Paperwork might be the price you have to pay to help somebody else live a full and abundant life. The second internal obstacle is not getting the essence. People get confused. It's not about the plan. It's not what it looks like. It's, it's about a changed life. People who don't get this, I sometimes tease people who don't get the essence. And when I say, like, I suppose your idea of a good poem is when you count the number of words. Hey, it's only got 186 words, a cool poem. That's not getting the essence of poetry. The truth is, when we, when we know the essence is when we come to care for each other. I took a class, I, I majored in philosophy. We were reading Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And one of the students in the class was asked to report on that book. 
And he reported and he stumbled. You could tell he read it, but he stumbled. And the professor said to him, I love this, what he said. He said, it's clear to me, Miss Jones, that you have gone through Immanuel Kant. But Immanuel Kant hasn't gone through you. That's what missing the essence is, when it hasn't gone through you. And a third, which might be the most important, is when we're in a hurry. What we should do every day is have a sign on our desk that says, slow down, don't be in such a hurry. The key behavior in doing all of this, I think, is, is paying attention to being a good listener. Listen, here's an interesting thought. Listen to what the person is going to say next. I'm not necessarily a great listener. I've tried to practice this. But we must become better listeners. If you want to read an interesting book about this, read a book called More Time to Think by Nancy Klein. Let's talk briefly about the staffing crisis and external things. I don't need to go on a long uh, explanation about staffing crisis. Clearly, being short of staff is a problem in carrying out person-centered planning. I get a kick out of young people, especially when I talk to them, who are complaining about problems. I'm thinking to myself, you must be nuts. You're in human service, it's about problems. Why would you think you shouldn't have any problems? This much I would tell you, you have a huge problem if you think you shouldn't have problems. And then we have regulatory requirements, what I call the bureaucratic point of view. John O'Brien said years before it came into regulation, person-centered planning will be ruined when it's put in regulations. Regulations, and I'm not trying to challenge the people who talk about the settings rule. I'm for it, I support it. But I would just tell you this. Rules are not about installing quality. Regulations are primarily in place to stop bad things from happening. I still have a memo I carry around, it's probably 40 years old, that was uh, written from the director of the, I think then it was the New York Department of Mental Hygiene, that forbid people from doing somersaults after they ate peanut butter. Actual, actual, actual memo. See, here's something to, to, to take home. Not getting something wrong does not equal getting something right. Serving a meal in which nothing tastes bad does not equal having a good meal. And then the last external obstacle is what I call combined documentation. I've alluded to it, but I think this is horrific. One of the things that we think about in terms of a person center thinking and planning is it really is like a chest of drawers. That assessments are important. Social histories are important. Health and medical information is important. Legal information is important. So is safety and behavior concerns. The history of service supports and other regulatory requirements. But if you think about it as a chest of drawers, why does a person with disability have to haul the whole chest of drawers with them? I'm familiar with the states who now have computer-generated assessments and pronounced, and I think they're killing it. I've looked at New York, Florida, Indiana, and you know what? You talk to people, they don't want those plans either because they're too long. So what we're saying, what we need to work with the feds is saying, okay, it's okay to have a person-centered record. That's different than having a person-centered plan, and we say the plan should be on top of the chest of drawers. Some of you might be in the middle of person-centered planning efforts right now, and you might not be pleased with them. And I would share this thought with you from C.S. Lewis. This is what he said and observed. He said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Some of you had that experience in remodeling your homes. Other of you, by the way, may have had it in your marriage. Halfway, you said, why the hell did I marry him? It's at the halfway mark that we need the best leadership. Let me go back to singing for a second. When I was in high school, I had a chance to sing in a choir. And there wasn't any fixed order in which we stood, but I sang in the bass section. And I always tried to stand next to a fellow by the name of Henry. We called him Hank. And one of the things I realized when I stood next to Hank was I sang better. I hit the notes better. I felt better about myself the way I was singing because I stood next to Hank. And I would say to you, stand next to positive people. Stand next to positive people. Stand next to optimists. Get away from the people who drag you down. There's a Romanian proverb that says, tell me your five closest friends and I'll tell you who you are. So my notion is to hang out with positive people. We believe, as optimists, that things can get better. And this I would say to you, and, and I don't say this to, to, to leave you in a bad way. 
if you were a person with disability or you were a family member, who would want to be supported by a person who's habitually pessimistic? A person who might believe that failure is inevitable. Now, I have an awareness even at places like CQL, the people who tend to be most pessimistic, it's probably okay, are your CFOs, especially today. But I'm gonna share something with you that my wife said I shouldn't share with you. Some of you might be in a place in your life where you need to borrow some money from somebody, right? So here's my, one of my concluding thoughts. Borrow it from a pessimist, because they won't think you're gonna pay them back anyway. <laughs> I trust these thoughts have been interesting to you. We would welcome your reaction. If I afflicted you, my son's email address is tdeister at trinityservice.com. I'd welcome your reaction. We talk a lot about getting better. And I would say this to you, be of good cheer. We can choose the way we think, and that indeed can change the lives, your life and the lives of others. So I leave you with one last thought that comes from Charlotte Webb, and that's this. We need to start now. We can always do the next best thing. So I say to you, thank you, stay well, keep on singing.